Hello everyone, welcome to the internally screening review of Curse of the Demon. My name's Adam. My name's Rupert. And today we are continuing Hooptober. Still into January, we are continuing on because why the hell not? And we are carrying on with this, which satisfies our 1950s film for the eight decades bracket within Hooptober. Uh, this is a British-American collaboration uh, focusing on a mystery supernatural kind of thriller in which a professor is struck down by some kind of eerie supernatural force and our hero played by Dana Andrews has to uh, fly from America to the UK in order to find out what has happened to this uh, acclaimed man. He is a skeptic, he, he does not give much credence to the idea of supernatural beings but he soon encounters a very uh, sinister character, our villain of the piece, played by uh, Neil McGuinness. He starts going down the rabbit hole as it were and uh, uncovers more and more eerie and grisly truths surrounding this uh, fateful event. Uh, Rupert, what did you think of Curse of the Demon? Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I'm actually, I guess, now kind of a fan of this director. It was directed by Jacques Tonneur or something. Mm. I don't know. He sounds French. Maybe he's French. Uh, I've seen one film of him previously directed Cat People, which is a famous horror film from the 30s. And this feels very different but has a similar um, kind of elegance and simple sophistication to the direction it's surprisingly just like incredible just like cat people where you have this kind of abstract maybe quite intimidating concept but he just directs it in a very accessible way yeah the film has its sort of goofy elements and it seems like it plays into it and the tone of the film is incredibly consistent throughout mm. i think a lot of it is carried by the fact that dana andrews is also just so great in this film uh, he's just absolutely full of charisma yeah. and the film really plays to his strengths um, I think like for example one of the best scenes in the film is a scene very early on on an airplane which just has this kind of physical comedy to it with this sort of relatable humour with him trying to sleep on the plane oh, um, yeah. a major character who's sort of yet to be introduced to the plot is sat behind him and you know she won't turn the light off and he's just trying to sleep and it almost reminded me of something that like Billy Alder, uh, Billy Wilder sorry, would include um, in one of his films and, you know that's a pretty big compliment yeah I yeah just think, for sure yeah, I, I, I think that even with the goofier elements of this film it just it executes it all simultaneously it feels sincere but also aware of what it is which feels like a bit of a contradiction but it like really plays into the goofiness of the concept of the film with you know the bad guy literally being like a magician yeah uh, yeah yeah and like having kids around his evil manner oh and he's but like dressed also, like a clown and stuff like that yeah yeah like it, it's it, it feels quite sort of knowing in that way mm. or maybe i'm just reading into it but it also when it comes to having uh you know a, a genuine sense of threat and you know stakes it doesn't really sacrifice anything on on that side either yeah i was very impressed with the, like the performances like of, of all the main characters like i you've been singing dana andrews uh, praises he is fantastic mm. i think uh, niall or neil mcginnis he makes such a compelling villain <laughs> he's like he's hilarious yeah he's he's a kind of a moriarty kind of figure i i feel like he's very um uh, poetic with his language and he's like I don't know he has this kind of theatricality to him but he he's also he's like an intellectual yeah 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 and he's not um, he's not so over the top as to make the camp of it unbearable there is a campiness to it for sure uh, yeah. as you say a knowingness but there's still a certain level of grit and, and intimidation that he's able to uh, convey with his performance. I particularly like the scene where he is dressed as the clown. I think the, <laughs> the clown costume, while ridiculous to begin with, and kind of undercuts the threat of him, makes him even more threatening by the time the scene is over, as there's like this um, spiraling wind that he is supposedly conjured uh, to intimidate Dana Andrews' character, and him sort of staring him down in this silly makeup suddenly <laughs> like twists the whole thing and makes it even more unsettling i don't know how i don't know exactly why that is but i think it's that juxtaposition between what you know to be friendly and safe and then the power that this guy can actually wield it was really yeah well executed yeah i enjoyed him and i also i think the key to it is just he seemed more lived in and more three-dimensional than that kind of villain 
normally would be mm. because you get a sense for his life outside of him being this kind of evil twisted he's like a cult leader right yeah but you sort of get a sense for you know what he is like in general you know mm. like he lives with his mum yeah and, he has a Norman Bates uh, kind of quality to him yeah for sure and he seems to feel like he's kind of been pushed into this position and you know he's just kind of rolling with the supernatural forces and he doesn't really have much say in it when you know as, a, as an audience member you're supposed to say well of course you do uh, and that's sort of part of the conflict with his character mm. but that he's he's sort of you know in his mind letting nature run its course with the supernatural stuff and yeah I, I definitely enjoyed him but I, to me Dana Andrews he just he's so effortlessly charismatic uh, and to like a really uh, what could be quite a dry kind of boring stereotypical character like we've seen plenty and plenty of like sci-fi horror uh, you know whatever it is films where you have the cynic character and I think right. he actually he plays it very well you know, and it's got that kind of he's yeah. an American in in England but he plays the, the cynic in a very refreshingly characterful way because I feel like that character can be really overdone and I think mm. Yeah, for me, he was the highlight of the film. Yeah, no, I like the kind of push-pull thing they do with the uh, uh, sceptic narrative because he's very determined not to believe what has been presented to him. And then there's more and more scenes where he can't give the same excuses he gives and he starts to sort of cave into the pressure and f he feels like he's being swayed by it. But then his like, determination kicks back and he's like, no, no, there has to be a, a real reason for this. Um, I, I know what you mean, that this sort of stereotype ha exists in a lot of horror and sci-fi films, like the, the, the disbeliever, because you need that character, the, the character grounded in reality to link the plot to the viewer who knows this yeah. doesn't exist so it kind of putting yourself directly in the well he is he's an audience in yeah right? exactly exactly um and uh, yeah it was just it was executed simply but effectively and i think that was important and i think that that's it's nice to contrast it with um peggy cummins character the woman he meets on the plane because she is so fervently committed to the belief that, that that something supernatural did happen to I forget is it supposed to be her father or her it's her father I think yeah. and basically the the core plot kind of basically relies on that as like triumvirate of characters where you have him as the cynic her as the sort of um I guess stereotypically sort of emotionally invested uh, she has a little bit more depth to her she she gives a pretty good performance as well so she doesn't feel uh, you know, too much like a classic, you know, women supporting role or anything. Mm, yeah. Uh, but that is that is still her role essentially, along with you know the villain, and that is kind of like how the plot moves forward with those three. Because you know, in many ways, she kind of has more interests. Uh, well, not more interests in line, but more philosophically in common with the villain. But she's right. obviously opposed to what. Yeah, he's on the doing. opposite end of it. Yeah. And obviously, the contrast between the two, uh, Dana Andrews and P uh, Peggy Cummins. Uh, provides like most of the humor for the film and most of the fun in them just interacting because yeah. for the most part this film is pretty held back. Yeah, well, in terms of the sort of horror aspects and the visual um, thrills you get, uh, it really is kind of bookended by the most extravagant moments, I would say, uh, which is interesting. Um, not to spoil it too much, but those moments were quite heavily contested by the director Jacques uh, Jacques Tonnerre. I, I assume I don't know how to pronounce his name. Jacques Tonnerre. <laughs> I don't even know if he's actually properly French. Uh, no, he is French. Director. He is French. Okay, okay. Um, and uh, he he was kind of warring with the producers about the inclusion of more heavily supernatural elements. Uh, because I think he wanted to make the story m more nebulous as to whether what was happening was kind of uh, mind tricks or just like the psychological pressure and threat going on. That kind of middle ground uh, uh, ambiguity between whether what was happening could be explained or whether it was supernatural and the mm. film i think actually strangely for the better because i think the moments the threat of it is more palpable and intimidating with the visual presence of the horror but i do understand the want on a story level for that kind of ambiguity i think that would make it more powerful i think i kind of disagree because i think the film actually kind of suffers in picking a mid-ground instead of committing to one or the other. Because the film does present you with something pretty concrete immediately, I do feel like 
the film feels like it really winds down and I think it kind of hurts the this could also oh, just be I a part see. of I think the film does feel like it has a, a good amount of empty space in terms of pacing uh, particularly sort of around the uh, the second to third act transition I kind of wish either the studio uh, had let him just do his more ambiguous thing uh, because the, the the play on it being ambiguous doesn't really work in this film since you're offered a concrete answer pretty much immediately yeah. so you already know so there's not really any tension but i guess there. i guess it's more of a what if because ob obviously there there is no version of this film without the uh the presence of the the, the supernatural so it's hard to compare what mm. one product would be versus the other i i'm more speaking of the hypothetical film that Jacques Tonnerre wanted to make. So I'm just saying basically that I, I still feel like the core experience of the film would have been improved if they'd have taken one way or the other. Because with the presence of what they show you early on, if they had committed to that and maybe used that a bit more or developed it a bit, that could increase the fun factor of the film and you could still have most of the film stay pretty much the same uh, but be able to introduce sort of more sort of middle act type beats with you know some uh, uptick in you know action or excitement or whatever it is right whereas as it stands i feel like the film opens in a blaze uh, and then sort of winds down until you get to the final sequence where it sort of goes back up Right, uh, so well, it feels a little uneven to me in that way. I, I, I mean, I will agree to an extent, but I do think there are some like really key scenes in those second and uh, third mm. acts where the tension is raised in a, in a, in an engaging way for me. I mean, I guess going into some uh, some spoilers, there's a scene where he enters the house of our villain after dark. This grand mansion, uh, and he sort of oh yeah, he's sleuthing around. And he obviously gets caught immediately, and our villain does some kind of uh, hilarious monologue. There's a there's a really goofy bit of puppetry that I really enjoyed, where he sees a cat, and then the cat turns into some kind of uh, demonic <laughs> jaguar. And uh, when he's cute. wrestling it, it's literally just like a stuffed toy that he's like throwing around, that he's grabbing onto his neck. Um, I couldn't help but wonder if that was like a reference to cat people or something. Oh, maybe. It like cat people really like it, there's like one really pivotal moment where something happens and it's done much more subtly than that. Okay. Uh, so I was kind of wondering like, is this is he referencing himself? This is set in the cat people universe. <laughs> yeah, he's he's advised by the villain not to return the same way he came in because uh, he snuck round the back through the woods, and he goes sod it, I ain't gonna listen to you. I'm gonna go back, and he goes <laughs> yeah. through the woods and he gets sort of haunted or stalked by wh whichever sort of demonic force it is that the character is conjuring but you don't see it unlike when you see it at the beginning and you see it at the end you just see like the eerie plume of uh, bright smoke that it seems to come from therein lies like a sort of genuine moment of sort of horror and tension where yeah. our character really starts to like that's a, a pivotal moment in our in terms of the character really starting to believe that mm. maybe something is going on here and the following that you have it might actually come before I'm, I'm, st I'm getting my uh, the timings confused to certain scenes but one key plot detail is that um, in and around this murder mystery there is this uh, I guess an acolyte of the cult leader is in a mental institution because he murdered his own brother supposedly and he's just in like a catatonic state he won't talk to anyone he's like completely frozen to the world and the main character goes to the family that his family's farm in order to seek permission to do psychological experiments on him in order to get information from him and it's such an eerie bizarre scene or the way all the characters talk is so sinister and um that was a good scene yeah uh, it's it, it, there's like it really sort of arty out of nowhere where the film that I think you alluded to before, it does play things very straight, kind of presents the information as is. This mm. is one scene where things get kind of like um, psychedelic and weird. There's um, one visual cue that I like where when he is mentioning the curse, like the- Yeah, it has that strange effect. It has this like watery effect on the screen. 
where yeah he, he looks like he's gonna pass out or something but he doesn't and then all the characters are just speaking so incredibly threateningly to him and there's loads of them as well there's like mm. 10 or 12 people in this room all sorts of blank eyed and staring that was amazing and yeah, then that was a great scene and I like to be fair I do think the film is generally very well presented it yeah. has like a real uh, noirish feel to it at points mm, mm, for like sure. there's shots with like all these like shadows and like mm. these like sharp angles it almost has like a kind of uh, German expressionist kind of tinge to it which would make sense I do love the, the look director's of it. history yeah no that does make sense I, yeah I, I think the uh, cinematography is pretty beautiful throughout for, again for for what I anticipated to be very a sort of very standard B movie affair it actually yeah. has like really you know, high craftsmanship to it like it, it yeah for sure it presents itself it, it, and with that title yeah exactly it seems so silly but yeah it has such like a seriousness and commitment to it. its uh its story its concept and it, it conveying the threat of it as convincingly as possible it's not it, it it doesn't feel content just pandering to what you may expect of I guess 50s B movie horrors. I guess the the era where the B movie was truly born. This it seems to rally against uh, rail against that. I should say. Yeah, it's a far cry from like your sort of budget hammer knockoff. Right. It's definitely got a whole lot more going for it. And yeah, I, I mean I don't know what the budget on it was, but clearly. I think almost all the credit has to go to Jacques Tonner and uh, Dana Andrews, who I believe had a pretty significant influence over the script and how it went, right? Uh, and you know how his character was, you know, going to be written. So you might look at the cover and see the title and think, you know, this is going to be, you know, like Plague of the Zombies, which I love, but this is is kind of a cut above. It's yeah, like a re yeah. It's a really sort of well crafted piece of filmmaking as yeah. a whole. Yeah, uh, Plague of Zombies was like impressively great through like the absolute yeah, despite yeah. <laughs> in spite of its budget and everything constraining it, its studio that it has such like a a beloved reputation, but still a reputation of a certain kind. If you know what I mean, this yeah, Plague yeah. of Zombies was kind of just quaint, whereas this is also quaint, but in a has like a a sort of level of technical uh, excellence that uh, I don't uh, think Plague genuine, of Zombies. Could yeah. have afforded. <laughs> uh, yeah, a genuine artistry to it. Like, uh, it feels so purposeful. What did you think of the finale of the film? Okay, so it, it, I guess in that finale, we're following the 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 villain is trying to escape. So throughout the film, from to from, Southampton, he's trying to go to Southampton. Bad move, <laughs> London. Yeah, is I know. Much, escape London is to much, Southampton. <laughs> London is much nicer than Southampton. Um, Everywhere is nicer than Southampton, unless you're counting Portsmouth. <laughs> Uh, I hope we don't have any loyal Portsmouth for viewers. Fuck out of here, I'll block you. <laughs> Establishing from earlier in the film, the villain curses our lead character and says you only have this many days to live before you're, you're going to get got by a big old demon. and yeah. Which is what turns out happened to the uh, professor who was killed in the opening scene. And as the time draws near for the curse to take effect, it turns out that the curse is sort of written on a piece of paper and if that piece of paper burns or is destroyed then it's done you've got the curse and you can't do anything about it but they manage to stop the piece of paper from being destroyed and they plan on i guess giving it back yeah it's kind of a power play he's sat on the train and the train's going mm. uh, and he has the uh, peggy cummins like hypnotized and she's like sat opposite him and he in a power play kind of shows up and he's like whatever happens to me you know, it's going to get you too because I'm right here. So what are you going to do? I'm yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got like, you know, minutes on the clock. I'm ready. And he's, he's freaking out. Yeah. Yeah. The guy is like, he like tries to bluff briefly, but he's like, no, 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 I can't take this. And he like runs away. Yeah, yeah. Then he is revealed that Dana Andrews manages to sneak the note into his pocket. So he, he gets fully got. I, yeah. I think um, something I, I guess I take issue with in that moment, in that scene, is that the character, the villain, has done such a pivot into pure terror and i guess it's something that is hinted at earlier where he kind of suggests in scenes you know more private scenes that he is kind of in regret at unleashing 
such a, like a, a dark power that he himself well, he kind of implies that he's kind of powerless to it as well yeah he does it's all a bit vague like he kind of seems like he's also a passenger and that he kind of wishes that he hadn't been involved in this in the e first place exactly like he, he had an idea about what he wanted to achieve from this like he wanted to achieve some unbelievable level of power but instead the satanic force is basically just hungry and if he doesn't sate that hunger in whatever way is demanded of him then he is at the mercy of this demon essentially uh yeah. so so yeah his, his his terror levels kind of dial up by quite a significant amount by the end uh, to yeah. the point where he's like a jittery nervous wreck even though it was hinted it felt like a big step up like a big yanking in pressure and it did sit a bit odd it felt like oh we've have we lost a scene here kind of i vibe. actually didn't mind that because like in the in, in the first scene that they meet it kind of he's kind of flexing on Dana, Dana Andrews mm. he's kind of like swinging his big dick around and he's sort of like check this out you know oh you're a skeptic look what I'm about to do and he does the wind thing and like whatever Dana Andrews does he kind of he's playing it so cool like he's one step ahead of him but ultimately he does kind of seem like a very insecure person you mm. know who you know lives with his mum and uh, clearly enjoys having this level of power that he does over his cultists yeah. so the moment he's kind of posed alone uh, you know without any sort of backup from anyone uh, and a real threat is pushed onto him he just kind of cracks which I think kind yeah. of actually works I, I that honestly didn't bother me yeah I, 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 I kind I, of see your complaint but I disagree I, I, I mean I understand the trajectory I just think that the film kind of there's a slightly jarring jump in terms sure. of where where he goes from and where he ends up but I totally understand that transition. I would have just preferred it to be smoother because I, th I think it would have been interesting to see that character acting unusually under a greater uh, stress. Sure. Um, but I, what, the thing I really like at the end is, again, we get to see the demon. <laughs> the demon looks amazing. I love the look. It's so It's uncanny. hilarious, but also quite creepy. Yeah. It's really creepy. The way, they, the way they bring it in with this swirling mist stuff and it like appears like a ghostly image that gets sort of more and more concrete on the horizon and it's massive as well it's yeah. huge like it's such an intimidating thing to witness uh, so animalistic i love the I w whatever puppet they used for it was fantastically made i love the way in the ending it's like it's so huge compared to the first time you see it mm. and it like has it in, in his hand and he like kind of Drake flings him about yeah kind of yeah, almost yeah. has a sort of godzilla-esque quality to it yeah and it, yeah and it does look pretty good uh, yeah. and then yeah i guess once again it kind of um, evades detection which is kind of a, a, a cute aspect of it no one sees this giant fucking demon. yeah well i guess the implication is that only the person that is cursed sees it you know the first time it appears there is only one guy around to be fair i i, I allow that i allow that i no, think it was I, fine I, by me it i think it me. fits and i like the way the policemen go over they realize that because the it's on the train tracks he's trying to flee they uh, pin it on him being hit by the train like he's been mangled but he's like oh there's like what all these gash marks there's no way the train could have done that i i quite like that's just a quite an eerie line Obviously, that works way better in the version where the demon isn't explicitly there and he's just yeah. imagining shit. But I, I, th I still think it's like suitably eerie. Dana Andrews and Peggy Cummins, they're like, yep, yeah, I ain't sticking around to look at the body. I'm good. <laughs> let's go home. Let's let's have a nice rest of our lives away from all the demons. Yeah, and like any good 50s film, it ends incredibly abruptly. It just goes bang, they leave the train <laughs> yeah, station, bang, they're gone. You know, I kind of miss that. Not that I was, you know, alive and watching films in the 50s, but whenever I see a 50s film and it just kind of goes, end, it's like, it's kind of refreshing in a way. Because no, so that. many yeah. films these days, like, you know, whatever 100 Avengers films that we've watched, or I don't know, we watched Last Night in Soho recently, and that feels like it takes forever to end. It's kind of nice to have a film that just kind of goes, it's over, bang, credits, yeah. and that's just it. That's you know? it. I think this was a um, a thoroughly enjoyable film. It kind of went against all of our expectations. It's, I think it's lovely to go back and find like a, a charming black and white 50s film, because I, I, so often I find at least with films like these, because they're of such a completely different generation of filmmaking, you have to make allowances for it. You have to temper your expectations. Yeah, you have it, to yeah. go, oh, well, it's good, you know, for the era. It's, uh, you know, if you ignore these mm. aspects, you ignore this. But honestly, 
I don't really feel I have to make those sorts of concessions with this, uh, mm. for the large part. It really artfully made. Rupert, what do you reckon you would give Curse of the Demon or Knight of the Demon? Depending on whether <laughs> it was the well, we Elon actually Gators watched Knight of the Demon, I believe. So yeah, I, w I would give since I haven't seen Curse of the Demon, I have to <laughs> give Knight Knight of the Demon a, a, a nice strong seven, sort of mm. leaning towards an eight maybe on a rewatch. Uh, it's basically uh, not a very simple story, but a simple enough, very well crafted script uh, that's been uh, directed incredibly well. Uh, has some really great performances and just kind of ticks a lot of the boxes that any really great film should mm. uh, and I think that if someone is interested in old school horror films or getting into 50s films and they've they've seen you know the classics this might be something really good to branch out to or if you haven't even seen the classics this is actually I feel like a, a really solid place you could start yeah with like some some classic horror because this has it, it's incredibly accessible it's not uh, you know, super over the top or anything. If you like your horror, maybe just a little bit more subdued and character focused. I think this is a yeah. a, a really solid pick, and I think it's aged really well. So yeah, I would For give sure. it recommend seven out of ten. Yeah, I'm with you. Seven out of ten. I think, as you say, yeah, it, it's not too abstract. It's very tangible. There's something very effective about the procedural storyline, the investigation type storyline uh, you know it, it can be a bit of a trope a bit of a crutch for some films mm. and not every film does it well uh, some films make that feel quite tired but in in the right context and I think in certain horror films that can be a really neat way of uh, giving the story a firm sense of pace yeah this is just a really really enjoyable deep cut from the 50s uh, yeah. made by a respectable director as well so if you do choose to watch this you're not just watching some random film you know you, you're you're watching an artiste so yeah that was our review of night of the demon curse of the demon whichever you want to call it if you like this review uh, please consider giving this a like and a subscribe and if you didn't like this video if you think we're too harsh on this give it a dislike uh, not that you'll be able to tell um, because it's gone but we'll be able to tell you can hurt our feelings instead all that's left for me to do now is thank you for watching i've been adam I've been Rupert. And we'll catch you again next time for the next horror film review. Peace. Peace.